I have no data to back this, but I'm pretty sure that this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in Bedford. That, it just feels right to me to say that. So anyway, welcome to Cheat Code, everybody. If this is your first Bitcoin conference, I want to be the first to officially welcome you to the cult. You're now in a cult. Lock the doors, please. Back there, I'm looking at you. Uh, Kool-Aid will be served momentarily. Listen, I was thinking about this the other day, and being in a financial cult, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, if you think about it, all of the best investments of the last like 30 or 40 years have had cult-like followings. Apple, Nvidia, Tesla, you know? But then again, so have all of the, the worst ones. Um, Herbalife, Enron, XRP. So I guess the question is, you really gotta ask yourself, is this one of the smart cults or one of the dumb ones. So maybe to ascertain, you know, if you're in a smart one or a dumb one, just talk to people, get a sense, you know. Then again, this is Pete's conference, so maybe skip that, do that next conference, you know what I mean? Um, let's see. So, a few years ago, the pandemic laid bare a harsh reality globally for all of us which is that we're totally fucked. We're so fucked, you guys. Uh, rampant currency devaluation by global governments, restrictions on free speech, on free association, uh, movement licenses, surveillance technologies, Orwellian you know, totalitarian control over not only what you, you know, where you go and who you associate with, but what you think and believe. Um, the question that I have to you is, over that time, it's a pretty simple question, did your life get better or did it get worse? Because speaking for myself, even though that was a pretty shitty time, my life actually improved. And the reason why it improved is because I had the cheat code, which is Bitcoin. If your answer was no, you may be missing a piece to the puzzle. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I wanna take you back to March 12th of 2020. Uh, this was the day that COVID hit the global financial markets. And uh, I remember it vividly because Bitcoin went to 3,800 and my fucking net worth got obliterated, which sucked. It really sucked. Um, I remember though, I, I listened to a Bitcoin podcast. It was raining that day where I lived. I went outside. Um, I watched the rain. I had a whiskey. I sort of calmed my nerves. And I came inside and I told my wife, What's going to happen next is going to be very bad for the world, but very good for us. And I felt conflicted saying that, but I believed it. Because you have to remember, the world was on fire at this time. So what would give me the confidence to make such a declarative statement about what was going to happen? How could I see things so clearly? And the answer is because I had a cheat code. So what is the cheat code? It goes by different names. Michael Saylor calls it buy Bitcoin, don't sell Bitcoin. Matt O'Dell calls it uh, stay humble and stack sats. If you follow me on Twitter, I've been known from time to time to say things like, just hodl, you fucking pussy. Uh, <laughs> By the way, I wrote that before Matt and Sailor were beefing, but I think it just goes to underline the point that two guys who uh, have totally opposite philosophies and worldviews both have the same mantra as their, their North Star. See, thinking in Bitcoin is the cheat code that will enable you to have a meaningful and prosperous life. That's, that's the big theme here of this conference, okay? Money is a language, right? Which is to say it's an operating system for the human mind. English is the primary language of most people in this room. Um, we're de facto sort of born into that. We learn languages without really thinking about it. And money is one of the second languages that we learn and one of the most important languages throughout our life. See, languages are important for being able to unlock the environment, right? At some point when you're young and you want a ball, say, you see a ball across the room but you don't know how to get it, and then at some point you, you learn this magical incantation, which is the word ball. And you can get your mom or your dad, you know, who's a much larger person than you, to bring you the ball, right? And, uh, you know, whereas if you just cry, then, <laughs> then, you know, you might get a butt wiping that you don't necessarily want, and nobody's got time for that right? So you've learned basically a magic cheat code, and this magic cheat code is, I say ball, I say the word ball, 
and mommy or daddy brings me over a ball, which is the thing that I want, right? It's a superpower, especially when you're a uh, one-year-old. Trust me, I have, uh, I have kids and they're, they're petty tyrants. Um, a few years later, you go to the store with you know, your mom or your mummy, as you guys would say in the UK, and you see a bear you like on, let's say, the bottom shelf. So you do what any enterprising two-year-old would do, and you, you attempt to steal it. You, know, you want to take it home with you. And then after your mom catches you and you know, forces you to uh, <laughs> bring the bear back and apologize to the store clerk, you find out that the bear costs money, and this is a second unlock and a second language that you're necessarily going to have to learn to get the things that you want in life. So this language, this background programming, this operating system for the human mind, it will be there uh, permanently for the rest of your life. It's here in the room with us now. There's nothing in this room that money hasn't touched. Money brought me here from America. Money brought all of us here to Bedford today. Money paid for this conference hall. Uh, money put on this event. Money has given you your haircut. Money is everywhere. It's touching everything. And we are always calculating you know, how much things cost in the background, even though we don't think about it. So this is not just true now, but people who think in Bitcoin tend to outcompete. This is one of the things that we've learned over the last 15 years, right? And it's not just true in modernity, but it's true across uh, history, which is anytime a civilization with a weak currency met a civilization with a hard currency, they got fucking destroyed by the civilization with the hard currency. There was a very specific reason the sun never set on the British Empire, and it wasn't just about naval might, right? The Americans, we learned from you guys, so really you guys are to blame. I mean, it's not our fault, like, sorry. Um, the reason that individuals in modern times outcompete is simple. When you save in fiat currency, life around you, I'm sure everybody has, has recognized this, life around you gets more expensive. Life is seemingly getting harder. And, you know, you're wandering around all day going, what the fuck, why is it so hard? It shouldn't be this hard. It wasn't this hard for my grandparents or my parents. Why is it this hard for me? I don't understand. Well you don't have the cheat code, right? When you think and save in Bitcoin, everything around you gets cheaper over time, which is why I was able to go through the entirety of the global pandemic. And even though I had some social friction and stuff, um, I was able to come out better than I went in is because I was thinking in the correct unit of account. So listen, I can't tell you where Bitcoin falls in the pantheon of monetary technologies, nor can I tell you how it subsumes and supersedes Austrian economics. But I'm a Bitcoiner, so I can tell you what I believe, and what I believe is this. I believe that Michael Saylor's company is going to be the richest company on earth, doing nothing but just holding Bitcoin. I believe El Salvador is going to be a global player uh, in the digital economy in the 21st century. And I believe that a little football club from Bedford is going to the Premier League within a decade. I truly believe that. Now, these are pretty unusual beliefs, and I don't think many people in town even believe the thing I just said about Real Bedford, right? Um, and even though, you know, listen, the town is lovely. I've been here for two days. I did the river walk. Although there were parts during the river walk where I was like, I took a wrong street on a wrong you know, corner, and I thought, felt like I was gonna get stabbed, but then I like turned the other way, and it was very idyllic, and there was like a swan and like an English cottage. I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure what's going on here in the UK. Um, <laughs> it's like, so I don't have a particular affinity to Bedford, but I can see what Pete is doing with the club, and I can see how Bitcoin is supercharging the club, right? I don't have a particular affinity to El Salvador, but I can see how Bitcoin is supercharging El Salvador. And I don't have a particular affinity for Michael Saylor either, even though, you know, I have been invited on the yacht, and I got served Wagyu cheeseburgers. I don't say this to brag. I say this to let you know that I'm important, okay? And I have fancy friends. Um, <laughs> the cheat code is relatively simple once you understand it, but it's not easy. It's really difficult. And um, studies show consistently that the only time adults change their minds about major things in life is basically when there's a war on. And today, there is a war on whether you believe it or not, but it's a different war than, you know, say, World War II. It's, it's a war for your sovereignty. It's a war for your freedom. It's a war for your mind. You need something that's able to fortify your mind. You need something that's able to fortify your life and gift you prosperity when you've been you know, stuck inside of a slave system which is trying to take it from you. I've been here in Bitcoin now for about 10 years 
And if you think it was easy <laughs> that I just bought Bitcoin and then I held on to the Bitcoin, God, I wish that was true. Um, it was so painful, you guys. You have no idea. Anybody who lived through it knows what I'm talking about. But the emotions that come with hodling are just brutal. I wish I could tell you that I, that I just thugged it out, you know, like, like that turtle from Kung Fu Panda or like that baboon from The Lion King or like that rat from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, that I found my zen. But I'm not chill like those guys, you know? I spent most of the time crying and acting like a bitch. Uh, that's true. So allow me to impart some hard-won wisdom from my years of thinking in Bitcoin. Here are three things you need to know. First of all, whatever you think you know about Bitcoin is probably wrong, especially if you have a fixed worldview, or you came into Bitcoin and you thought it was a static system. It's not a static system. It's a highly dynamic system. And over the years, I've been more wrong about Bitcoin than I have been right, but I've been directionally correct because I followed the simple cheat code, which is buy Bitcoin, don't sell the Bitcoin, and, you know, hodl for prosperity, right? The second thing that you have to know is that thinking in this manner will make you seem basically crazy to everyone in your life who doesn't yet have this OS upgrade. I could tell you guys stories, a lot of stories, about all the people that thought I was crazy, but one story that stands out in particular is in 2015, um, my wife needed some money for her graduate school, and I had Bitcoin, which was worth like five grand, and I had a car, which was worth like five grand. So I was like, fuck it. And I sold the car uh, instead of the Bitcoin, and I got a cheap Chinese moped called the Tao Tao 50, and I rode around on this cheap piece of shit for the better part of a year. Everyone made fun of me everywhere I went, and I basically looked like an insane person. By the way, my net worth was actually pretty decent at this time, but I looked like one of the poorest street urchins you could possibly imagine. Um, a few years later during the 21 bull run, my friend came back to me and he said, you know, at that time I thought that you were the dumbest man alive. And I said, thank you. Uh, I, I see why we're friends. And, and then he goes, looking back, I realized that it was actually me that was being short-sighted and that you actually were very prescient and smart and right and cool and handsome. He didn't say all that. Um, <laughs> The third, the third thing that you have to know, so by the way, just be prepared to go it alone. Um, this is a journey that, like I said, happens within your heart and within your mind. The third thing is that conviction makes all of the difference in the world. It's, it's the sexiest story that we all like to tell ourselves that, you know, we would, oh man, if only I was here in 2011, dude, I would have totally bought Bitcoin, man. And then I would have been so rich, like billionaire status. That is not how it worked. There are so many people who were here who had their hands on thousands of Bitcoin, but were not able to hang on to it. And the reason they weren't able to hang on to it was because they were thinking in dollars. So when Bitcoin, you know, they had 10,000 Bitcoin and it rose and they had a million dollars, they were like, oh my God, I'm gonna buy myself a flat, you know, 1,200 square feet. Wow, I've made it. Now, like most of those people got destroyed along the way. So having absolute conviction is the thing that's going to make the difference in Bitcoin. And the later you are, the more conviction that you have to have, okay? So as you go along, just remember that. You should just devote as much time to stacking sats as you should to stacking your conviction. Um, owning Bitcoin was step one, but thinking in Bitcoin is what changed everything for me. It gave me a lens which allowed me to see clearly for the first time. The world was still a foggy maze for me, but through Bitcoin, I saw reality a system which was benefiting the few at the expense of the many. This knowledge was freeing, and Bitcoin showed me new paths and taught me to value truth, see the long view, and recognize that a system designed for the few at the expense of the many could be broken by the few, the few who actually gave a shit. I want to leave you with a bit of British history. Um, when Hitler engulfed Europe, there were members of Churchill's war council that wanted him to sue for peace with Hitler. Uh, Lord Halifax in particular, and, Ch and Chamberlain. And basically in a closed door meeting, Churchill told them, if this island story of ours is to end, let it only end when every man, woman, and child is choking to death on their own blood. That shit is gangster as fuck, you guys. <laughs> and to me, it's like, you know, I love the way that Churchill felt that way about his country and how much national pride he had. And it was the right move at the right time and he was the right man. And he's the reason that this conference is not being held in German today, right? But for me, you know, I don't feel that way about my national country. I, I feel that way about Bitcoin. Uh, and I, that's the sort of resolve, that's the sort of conviction that I have about 
this thing is that it really is all or nothing. I am all in on Bitcoin. I don't have, I'm 100% in, net worth invested. I don't have another way out. I don't have a backup plan, you know? And the more conviction I find and the more I go in, you know, seemingly, the better my life gets, right? The systems that we find ourselves ensnared in today, this invisible slave system, whose only justification for existence is to steal our time. I think we know that, right? Like that all of our politicians are basically stealing everything that isn't nailed down. It doesn't matter if you're in the UK or in America. It's happening everywhere. It's a global phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon because of fiat currency, by the way. But it only ends when we have the ability to fight back, and Bitcoin has given us that ability. Basically, they encroach and we relent. So they encroach further and we relent further. And we keep giving up our freedoms. For what? What are we getting for it? And meanwhile, most of us are hand-waving it away, saying it's not happening. And we're concerning ourselves with what's going on in the, the drama at our local pub, or what's happening with the princess, or the game, or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, the only thing that matters is that we protect ourselves from the people that are every day, all day long, trying to steal from us. The line must be drawn here, in Bedford. This is where we draw it, right here. Uh, no, no more. No more encroachments, no more bullshit. No more self-justification, no more kicking the can down the road. Bitcoin gives us the ability to say no to insults on our sovereignty, on our dignity. It makes us owners in our society again, not just renters on government land who are doing what they're told because they're forced to and they're scared. And if you wandered into this room today and this is your first encounter with Bitcoin, today during the panels and the speeches, you're going to hear about this cheat code. You're going to hear about the most important thing that's happening in your world in the world, but also in your world, and what's most important to you. So you have two choices once you hear this. You can either take the blue pill, you bury your head in the sand, you wake up in your bed and you believe whatever you want to believe, right? Or you take the orange pill and you see how far the rabbit hole goes. My call to you is that I dare you to make the bold choice, to seek a meaningful and substantial life, to resist nihilism, to believe that your life can be more, to pass something on to the next generation, to pass something of great importance forward in the blockchain of humanity. I dare you to play your role in the greatest story of our lifetimes, the monetization of Bitcoin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is absolutely incredible. To get 500, 600 people here in Bedford is unbelievable. But um, I want to set the record straight at the very start of this that we are still all the weirdos. Um, Bitcoin has not infiltrated society fully yet. We all know this. Um, and there seems to be like a huge dichotomy I see in the world where there's all the people in this room who are very positive and uh, like hopeful for the future. And then there's a nihilistic society that uh, know the system's broken but can't put their finger on why. Um, and you see these people who are scared to start a family, uh, can sort of resi re uh, resign to the fact that they're maybe never going to be able to afford a house. Um, they know the system's broken, but they don't know about Bitcoin. And so that's kind of why we're here to talk about the paradigm shift in money and, and the move towards this, this uh, new system. Uh, but a question for you, Harry, to start off is, why is this taking so long? We're 15 years in now, and here we are with 500 people, not 5,000 people desperate to hear about Bitcoin? Um, I think we are still early and it is, it is taking a long time. I think that the, the tricky part about Bitcoin and Bitcoin as money is that Bitcoin is a fundamental innovation and it has solved a, a true and deep and foundational technology problem. So before Bitcoin, scarcity was not guaranteed after Bitcoin, scarcity is available to the human species. Um, and I think that the, the tricky part about a foundational breakthrough, um, not only is that the rails that deliver that breakthrough to, to the globe, those are hard to build, um, but that we, we have a lot of deprogramming to do, and it's not enough to realize that the current status quo is not functional. Um, arriving at a solution and a hope and, and promise-oriented future is very challenging when you're living under 
you know, a regime, if you, if you think back to 1971 when we fully decoupled from the gold standard or 1913 when we began to decouple, those are incredibly long periods of time where you have a multi-generational deprogramming that needs to happen in addition to the technology rails that need to be built to deliver the deprogramming. Yeah, I just want to add on, on to that. This makes perfect sense where we are. Um, for, because the first thing you have to go through and you have to say, is this truly a first time? And if this is truly a first time, that means all of our priors, all of our history of knowledge, all of the books we've ever written don't have this information in it. And so first you have to get to the, that, is this true? Um, that this is so different so di that it changes the future. And that's a hard thing to do because what people do is they merge what happened in the past, their priors, to try to make this match with their reality. Um, when Galileo looked out of his system, our system, and saw, saw wait, Copernicus was right, um, the sun doesn't travel around the earth, it took 300 years for the Catholic Church to say he was right, right? Something, some, this is over 300 years. And, and he had an advantage, he looked outside the system. That's what Bitcoiners have. They have an advantage because they're measuring from a different system. They're measuring from a system tethered to energy. They're measuring from a system that looks unlike anything in the past. So it would be normal. It would be normal for a lot of people in this room. It would be normal for me. As you go from level zero understanding Bitcoin to level 10 understanding, as you go down that path, you have to unwire everything you ever knew about how, how things worked because all those things are from the system you used to measure from, and all of the books and all of the reference of that design is from that. So where we are makes perfect sense if you understand um, where we are in this new system. We're very, very early, but also incredibly hopeful. Yeah, I've got a comment on this one too, Danny. <laughs> Uh, when, I, when I'm looking at the, uh, the legacy system and you're looking at the bedrock of the, of the legacy system, it has worked very well for developed nation states where most of the equity is held and where most of the, uh, the people that were pulling the strings of, of the globe. Um, so they, they're looking at it up to 2020. And if interest rates just kept going down for 40 years, the value of the equity that they hold just kept going up in, in price. And so that system worked for them very, very well for a very long time. And so when you go to your question of like, why is it taking so long for people to understand Bitcoin? I would argue that the legacy system was working extraordinarily well for all of all of these people that are controlling the purse strings of society up until 2020. And now just all of a sudden in the last four years, you're starting to see that bedrock deflect and break down. And isn't it a surprise, and Jeff can attest to this, a lot of the new people that are coming into Bitcoin right now, you know where they're coming from? Real estate. You know why they're coming from real estate? Because all those cap rates that they watched get compressed for 40 years straight leading up to 2020, their, their properties just got more valuable. It got easier for them to, to roll the debt and everything worked great. But now all of a sudden they're, they're saying, hold on, something doesn't add up. Like what is going wrong? And this is a function of something that's just played out in the last couple of years. And for a lot of them, the, the really smart ones are, are looking at this saying, hold on, what is this Bitcoin thing? It just keeps going up. And maybe if I just start putting a little bit of that on my balance sheet and mix it with this physical stuff that I own that's getting repriced 70% down in some cases, or maybe even more depending on where they're at, they're starting to say there's something totally off. Something feels very different. They're looking at inflation starting to, to come back up. And so... I think it's going to start accelerating quite a bit from here. Uh, and I would say COVID 2020 was kind of like this demarcation point that is a transition from this legacy system to the new system for a whole lot of people. And I think it's just going to accelerate in the coming four to 10 years. So there's loads I want to get into with that. But just before we do, I think there's another uh, element to it, which is Bitcoin takes a fundamental mind shift change in taking agency over decisions. And Harry, you and I were talking about this a little bit before. Do you want to kind of expand on that? Um, I, I think a lot of it's re closely related to what, what Jeff said, um, but I think there's a, a, a personal reality that I think is very explanatory, which is, and I don't know, I think you guys have seen this chart, but it's the, the chart of the life of a turkey. 
Um, and I'm an American, so full, full disclosure, we do a thing called Thanksgiving. It's, um, uh, it's a great holiday, but if you look at the chart of the life of a turkey, um, every day gets better, right? They're born, they're well-fed, everything's great. And that chart just continues to climb up and up and up to the right. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle of November, uh, the chart goes to zero. <laughs> and so the turkey's life gets better every day until it dies. And, and so I think that we are all living on a very sort of individual basis somewhere along that chart where the existing system is highly functional, like Preston said, and we've got an enormous amount of prior evidence and knowledge, and we've spent all of the time building you know, peer-reviewed papers that, that govern our thoughts and, and maybe our financial advisor's thoughts. And all of those benchmarks are, are related to a system that is going to hit, you know, turkey zero. Um, and so that's hard to accept, first of all, because, you know, we've got however many decades of, of lived experience that uh, informs this idea that, you know, the way we're doing it is really an optimization function. But really we're living in this binary world where, you know, we need to go from zero to one as it relates to the new system, and the earlier you do that, you know, the better the seat on the bus you're going to get. Yeah, it, it, here's what I, and in, in even in some of these talks, we're talking about what it looks like in North America or what it looks like t tethered to the U.S. dollar system in Europe, the, the, essentially the beneficiaries of theft. That's what we're talking about. Because, because what the world looks like, and you know this, the world should be, the natural state of a free market is deflation. And, and how could it not be? Because you vote with everything you buy to get more value. And entrepreneurs come in and solve problems to get more value. And the only way it could be an inflationary is if you voted to get less value. So, so all of your time you choose things that give you more value and the free market provides that, and then when prices go up, it creates an incentive for more and more entrepreneurs to attack those industries to create more value, and they can't be successful unless you choose it. So you know that that is deflationary. Everybody nods when I say, yep, that's deflationary. And then if you add technology to it, it's exponentially deflationary. What does that mean? What that means, just that simple, those two statements, that we trade with each other all over the world to get more value, and we only use things that give us more value, means that the world we live in should be exponentially deflational, def deflationary. And everybody nods, yep, that's the world we should live in. Yet we, that would kill our entire financial system. So the driver of the manipulation of money is what I just explained. And why we don't see it early on? We don't see it because if you could, if you could convince people that inflation is required, you could steal a little bit of the productivity slowly from the entire population of the world, it would, it, it would it, it, it make massive power and massive gains. But then as technology moves faster and faster, you have to steal more and you have to steal more. Because remember, the rate of theft is not from zero, the inflation rate that you're measuring from. The rate of theft is that from the implied deflation rate. That means everybody on this planet should be getting richer naturally, even if you did nothing. That is what Bitcoin is measuring. Bitcoin is measuring, so the only people, reason people think Bitcoin is going up in price is because they're converting it to their fiat instrument, which is going down to try to save the financial system. Bitcoin is measuring all prices falling forever, and it will, if it, as long as it stays decentralized and secure, which I'm, and this is in, to your point, why am I sure it will? Because we're it, and I, once I know this, once I know that insight, I'm not going back to that system forever. Ever. I'm going to fight. I'm going to use my time and energy to move this across the world. And you and many of the other people in this room, many of the people on the stage are going to do the same thing. And as you start to understand that, more and more people join us and the world moves from our intention to where it should be. One final thing that I would add to the timeline piece uh, that I think is important to, to think about. I like to think in examples of like engineering uh, when I'm thinking about things and uh, 
who here uh, understands concrete and the the strengths and the, the weaknesses of, of concrete? Is there anybody? On? Okay, well, we're all going to learn a little little bit. I'm not an expert on it. Um, when you pour concrete and you put rebarb into it, you can make the, the, the strength of it a lot higher by putting the rebarb inside of it. Um, if you've ever gone to a hotel, you're in a, like a parking lot, and like you're d down under, under the ground and you see a crack in that concrete, it's showing you that there's some deflection, there's some maybe strength issues, maybe just a little wear and tear. But what a lot of people don't realize is you can make that concrete a whole lot stronger if you add more and more rebarb into it. The, the disadvantage that you get when you start putting so much rebarb into the concrete is that you don't get the cracks in the concrete that are forewarning and telling you that there might be some potential issues that need to be addressed. When I look at the way that the, the Fed, the Treasury, all these developed nation states have, have managed the economy, especially since the 2008 crisis, they've gone into deep into QE. We're seeing, I would argue, the Silicon Valley Bank is yield curve control for banks, not for everyday citizens. And so now you're starting to get these other types of tools that are being used that are, uh, think of all of these tools, where I'm going with this, all these tools are just putting more and more rebarb into, the, into this concrete that's trying to hold this legacy system together. And so once you put all of this stuff in there, what you're not seeing is the natural forces or the natural cracks that you would normally see from the, from the everyday person's point of view. And unfortunately, when that breaks, when that system that they've been reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing that's not showing you where the cracks are at, when it does break, it's gonna be this catastrophic just collapse and it's gonna be really quick and it's gonna to move to something that can soak up and catch all that buying power. Now, what, I'm not saying that that's gonna be a one month thing, but, I, but what I am trying to emphasize is it shouldn't be a surprise that so many people haven't seen what's happening. They're busy in their day-to-day -day jobs. They're, the, uh, like I described earlier, up until 2020, the value of everything just kept going up, and so they, they weren't looking for a solution. But I think, I think it's coming quickly, and I think that they've reinforced it with all of these just BS, non-free free and open market type activities, and uh, it's about to get really spicy in the, in, in the coming four to probably 10 years. So a couple of times you've mentioned 2020, and when I named this panel Paradigm Shift in Money, I was really thinking 2008, financial crisis and Bitcoin. So why do you think 2020 is potentially like the crux of the issue? Because that's when you had the interest rates literally bottomed out. I think you were at like negative 18 trillion worth of negative bonds on the market. And so from a price standpoint, like those yields being compressed literally into negative like we're entering into a contract that guarantees you're going to lose that much buying power because they're literally negative in yields. But the prices, if you could see the prices, were like the top of Mount Everest. And so in, in 2008, you weren't there. I, treasuries in the U.S. Uh, back in 2008 were, prior to the crash, were like 5 5.5% 5 on the 10-year. Um, after the collapse, they, they compressed them down a, a ton. The 10 year, I think, got to like 50 bips or 40 bips or something at, at one point, probably in 2008, tw uh, 2019, I'm sorry, 2018, 2019 timeframe. And then COVID happened, and then they haven't been able to keep them compressed down because what, what's happening is, is you have reality, the prices of, of things are now starting to break down in a manner that they, that they just can't throw more money at it. Physical reality is fighting back. And so that's starting to spin the other way, and that's why I'm saying 2020 is such a pivotal point because they, they were able to keep it compressed for another, what was it, tw uh, 12 years after 2008 that allowed the prices to remain elevated. Yeah, I, I would say expect this system to go on. So Preston and I might differ a little bit here, and we, I don't know. We, it's hard to say in a system like this because we, we feed it with our own actions. Everybody feeding... If you believe all the prices in the existing system and you aren't all in Bitcoin and moving your time and attention to Bitcoin, you're making the other system stronger. No matter who you vote for, in the, uh, it's all based on theft. You're making the other system stronger. TARP originally, the bailout in 2008, was, was totally against the free market because in the free market, um, even, even Warren Buffett would have failed in that if it was a free market. He was unhedged on, uh, 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 with derivatives. 
So that entire thing required a massive bailout from insiders to be able to cha change what our belief was. Um, and that 350 billion turned into 700 billion to be able to paper over. Well, so you just fast forward to 2020, now seven billion turns into five trillion. And when we t take the next one soon, the number is going to melt faces, what, what needs to be papered over. It's so ridiculous because it's the opposite side of what I'm talking about with technology and the deflation. It's just, it's the mirror image about how much money. So as technology moves faster, this system has to steal more from you. So it's actually been going on for much longer. And why we don't see it, same thing I said before. What typically happens, how we reset set these throughout all of history is, is we divide a nation, somebody gets elected, they divide a nation to, it's those people's fault. Um, once you divide the nation, playing by the same rules, you get elected, you steal more power, you consolidate power, then you, can, then you have to create a bigger enemy outside your borders, then you go to international conflict, and then you reset, winner resets and says, we promise we won't do it again, and it all starts again. That's the entire history of what money, look, money looks like and the control of money. And Bitcoin changes that going, uh, going forward. So it's been, uh, what I would say is, the free market has always been deflationary, just at a slower rate, because technology wasn't moving, as, uh, moving fast. So that led to currencies defaulting at a slower rate, the theft, us not seeing it at a slower rate, and now it's all happening faster, but it's always been go uh, going on. And where we are in this cycle, why it feels like 2020 to Preston might feel longer uh, to me, is we're getting towards the end of this cycle. And why do you think you see all over the world the war machine ratcheting up and getting people to divide all over the world and thinking there's a savior within the system? That's what's happening right now. And we're all living, we're just living through the end of that, cy the end of that cycle and what, what that machine will try to have you believe in a reset. And, and many on the stage, me being one, believe that that reset isn't needed. We're gonna transition to a whole new world in Bitcoin that's cooperative. I, I would add, I'm gonna take us back to the topic of our panel today, which is the paradigm shift in money. The, one of the really incredible pieces of that and, and what's baked into what a lot of Preston and Jeff just said is that the risk that we are all kind of passively running is counterparty risk. And so the reason that 2008 was so disastrous and the reason that 2020 felt so disastrous is because we were exposed to counterparties that were fundamentally unreliable with catastrophic potential outcomes. What Bitcoin does and what it offers us is an opportunity to save and grow wealth without a counterparty that we're exposed to. And so that is, on the one hand, incredibly productive, but on the other hand, comes with significant responsibility. It comes with continuing to support a network that is actually decentralized, um, is actually operating on a trust-minimized basis. It means you need to learn about how to secure your own Bitcoin and to be able to hold it in a self-custodial fashion. And so being able to onboard to a non-counterparty exposed financial rail is the way that we are able to achieve that transitory state where we have an opportunity to engage in a more free market environment, in a more deflationary environment. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, love, I love bagging on modern monetary theory because I think it's like the ultimate canary in our coal mine. And so for those of you who are not exposed to the MMT um, dumpster fire, their idea is basically, you know, the government is allowed and should um, print as much money as humanly possible because they have this sort of unicorn status as, uh, you know, printer in chief. And then when the obvious effects of inflation come to market, we'll just tax away the inflation. And so it's, it's this sort of, um, it's this terminal velocity of maximal counterparty risk where you have an unfettered um, government who, who's going to engage in, you know, the worst of, of moral hazard. So for anybody who has been exposed to economics in, in a more traditional sense, uh, moral hazard is this idea that the, the risk of, of power 
um, is that you'll behave badly. And we have a lot of evidence to say that, that these folks um, behave badly. And so you take sort of a maximal mon monetary uh, uh, printing view and then a maximal taxation view when the obvious effects of that behavior rear their head. And that's how we're going to manage the economy. So if you think you're exposed to counterparty risk today, there's so much more counterparty risk that you can get exposed to um, without any say in how you get exposed to that. And so entering a world where you are sole custodian and the system is, uh, is credibly neutral, you know, that's the hack and that's the paradigm shift is to remove the counterparty. So there's a saying in Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin's for anyone and not for everyone. Um, so if this is the future that we're kind of heading towards, Harry, how, how many people do you think Bitcoin can actually save? Um, it's a technology question fundamentally, right? So if you, if you look at sort of Bitcoin, the base chain, there are technical constraints. And so the, the Bitcoin is for anyone may be a function of your ability to pay a transaction fee um, or your willingness to buy the security model that a base chain transaction offers. Thankfully, there is an enormous uh, amount of development work that's happening in this sort of layered approach where there are going to be alternative trust models that you're able to opt into or maybe you're forced to opt into from a, from a price perspective. And so, you know, the same way that the internet, you know, when I use the internet, you know, I don't have a direct connection to my ISP and fiber that plugs into, you know, the, the direct connection. I have a layered uh, access point. Bitcoin is going to function the same way. I don't need the same level of exposure that maybe a 10, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin company, I'm trying to reprice in Bitcoin, um, a 10,000 Bitcoin company might have a very different kind of transaction settlement and trust model that they need to have in order to do their business. I might have a different trust model personally that happens at a different layer within that technology stack that's, that's more uh, amenable to my needs. The, the $5 coffee meme I think is a good one that explains this, which is that if I'm spending $5 worth of Bitcoin to, to buy coffee in Bedford, I don't need the same security model that I need to secure my children's inheritance. Uh, on that point, I think it's really important. Even if a person is only using layer two Bitcoin because maybe they, they don't have a lot of money and, and they're poor, um, the fact that you have global central banks that are going to have to play in a game that, that they're forced to, to tether themselves to Bitcoin's energy at the base layer, I think is deeply, deeply valuable to a person that's not using layer one. Because it's forcing everybody on the entire planet to, say, to play by a set of rules that no one government or person can step in, manipulate, change all of the economic calculation that then happens downstream of this really important and fundamental thing that's happening on the base layer. And so there's all these second, third, fourth, fifth order effects that pour out of having something that's, that's pegging money on a global scale that nobody can manipulate. So whether they're actually touching the source or they're, they're feeling the, the ripples of what comes out of it way downstream, it's deeply beneficial to, to every single person in the, entire, in the entire world because of this. And we've never had anything like this ever in human history. So I, I love his answer because it, it is addressing the technical challenges that, uh, you know, if, if a person has $50 worth of buying power, are they going to be able to interact with base layer one Bitcoin in 10 years from now? Probably not because of fees or whatever. But that doesn't mean that that person still is not having this tremendous change in their incentives because their incentives are completely getting warped and changed from what exists today. The whole reason you, the, the Alex Gladstein stuff that's addressed with the World Bank and the IMF and like how deeply corrupted how the planet has, has basically wired itself up because of those organizations, all of that gets turned on its head, which is profoundly impacting people that can't interact on base layer. So we got to be very careful on this talking point that that is not lost because it, it changes everything from an incentive standpoint. It's just so important. So 
Jeff, everyone in this room would be very comfortable with the idea of Bitcoin as a store of value. I think that's how most people today see it. Um, medium of exchange and unit of account still seem a little way off. How quickly do you think we get to that point? And at that point, is that when we have completely shifted the paradigm? Um, I spend in Bitcoin every day. I, I give an incentive to any business that'll take, take Bitcoin, and I spend in Bitcoin every day. I try to move as much as I can. So I'm already using primarily, in Canada, I can't use it in everything I do. Um, when I travel around, I try, you saw Joe on here, he uses it all the time. Many of, many of us do. So I'm already living in that future. I'm, and, and so when people say Bitcoin can't scale, and I use Lightning every day, I kind of, huh. Interesting, um, because because it is scaling, and it's scaling in layers. Just like just like Harry said, you'll meet uh, Obi here, and, and and what Fetty is doing is just going to be incredible for Bitcoin. And scaling in layers, and people can't see their actions and how that moves, and it gets more and more. It, why I think why this is hard is Bitcoin at the store of value is an in, is a global decentralized ledger and secure ledger open to anybody and so people um, you have a network effect as more and more people are understanding and moving their time in a store of value but network effects on the second layer your payment to happen locally so what peter is doing here if imagine only one store takes bitcoin and you got to take a bus to get to that store pretty soon the store doesn't take bitcoin anymore because nobody comes on the bus but as more and more stores start to take it, more and more people use it, and there's an incentive in all those stores, instead of paying 2.5% to Visa or MasterCard, they get no, almost no fees, nothing, and they get all the money, so they can pro provide more value to you, and it, it's a store of value to them. So it's just the incentives are so aligned, but it, the network effects happen locally. And then those local regions, merge with other local regions and it accelerates. But what I can tell you is if you just look at the data, Lightning is growing, the layer two is growing faster, fa or as fast as the internet was growing in 1996. And so when people say, why isn't this not happening? It's just not happening for them in their region because they're not using it as much because others. But as you start to use it more, if you just put your time into it, all of a sudden you'll see Magic. This is what everybody's doing here in Bedford. Coming to a small town, I was like, you're, you're part of the network that's accelerating this, and it's, it's happening all over the world. I, I just want to define network effect because I think it's really, really important to think in these terms, which is an, a network effect just means that an additional entrant into a network makes the experience for some or all of the other participants in the network better. And so it's important to think about it in those terms because it means, you know, for me, it gives me a lot of agency because um, I think, you know, I don't, I don't write code. I'm not technical in that way. Um, but when somebody makes, you know, a contribution to Bitcoin's technology, they're really upgrading all of us. And so their ability to have impact is incredibly high. Fund your local developer. Um, the second piece, though, is just if I open a business and I accept Bitcoin, I've made the experience of using Bitcoin higher value for some portion of the network. If I buy Bitcoin, it means that those are coins that other people can't get their hands on, which means that the scarcity is demonstrated to the entire network. If I mine Bitcoin, it means that I'm pulling some economic power from the energy markets into securing the Bitcoin uh, network. So there, there's all of these different entry points for the network effect to get strengthened. Um, I, listened, I listened to a really good talk from um, the early days of Facebook, which is, and Facebook's a bit of a dirty word, but, but they, they had this, this data point where, and I think it was at 14 connections, your usage of their product massively changes. And so to me, that's what Jeff is saying, is that there is this um, household use case tipping point where once you start to pay for things in Bitcoin more than three times a month, seven times a month, I don't, know, I don't know the right number, but we will all have this internal tipping point where being able to use Bitcoin enough is going to be sort of the snowballing effect where it's not, I, I don't want to pay with anything else anymore. 
Um, and it, it becomes the, the onboarding point where the network effect becomes strong enough within your, even just your own household to be able to make a full shift. I love that. Um, so Bitcoin's definitely maturing. Like we got ETFs earlier this year in the US. Um, good or bad, whatever you think of them, it's a sign of a maturing market. So Preston, do you think we're still early in this? I mean, Hong Kong's rolling theirs out uh, next week, right? Um, and I guess they're going to be uh, not cash settled like they are in the U.S., which I think is a good thing that you're creating that competition globally. My, my only concern is just um, you're going to get to a point where the states figure out that they're truly bankrupt. And that's going to be pro very problematic for the honeypot that exists. Um, you know, my concern is you got... You got people that don't want to go to jail running all of these organizations that are providing the custody or the wrapper on top of it. And uh, all it takes is just a couple signatures on a, you know, the pen, mightier than the sword, perfect example. People just sign some documents and say, yeah, we're taking half of that. Oh, it was a Bitcoin 2X. Uh, we're going to take the half that was levered and I guess we'll give, let the people keep the other half or whatever it's going to be. Um, but I think that there's going to be massive temptation for governments to step in and take some Bitcoin out of those treasuries at some point in the future. Because from, from everything I can see, the governments are just totally asleep at the wheel. It shouldn't surprise us that that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think it's very good from a sense that you just have more people plugging into this network. Um, and I know that that's Sailor's talking point. Um, I, I think it's more balanced to present people with uh, the risk that the, the treasuries could be raided. And if you're plugging into it in, in that manner because it's convenient or whatever, just you got to be prepared for the risks that are associated with that. And I think the risks are way higher than most are probably uh, performing when they're looking at what their weighting should be in their portfolio. So... Those are my general comments, but boy, it's going to bring a, a massive, massive wave of fiat onboarding that I don't think many are prepared for. Yeah, please remember what Pastor Preston said. Um, it, it's so critical in the world you're moving. This is a non-counterparty risk asset unless you introduce counterparty risk. You can hold it self-custody and you don't have any counterparty risk. The only chance you have counterparty risk is if you trust somebody else to it. Uh, uh, to hold it for you. If you do that, then you give the, the, the rules will change. They have to change. Your government today, and I wish I didn't have to say this, because of the way money looks, governments prey on us instead of serve us. Many don't know they do that, but that's what it looks like because they're extractive. They're extracting this broken money and, and inflation equals wage deflation. So why the, it's the same thing. So the why people feel like they're getting poorer and poorer and poorer, even if their house is going up, but they can't buy gas or they can't pay the heat in it, is because it's designed like that. And that, that means what Preston just said. If you have your money in a honeypot, or if you have your Bitcoin in somebody else's honeypot, the rules will change for it. Not they might change for it, they will change for it. So make sure you self-custody. I'm gonna shout out just another fellow Canadian of yours. Um, which is BTC Sessions on YouTube, has incredible YouTube videos on teaching you how to use self-custody tools. It is not hard. My parents can do it. It is, it is a very, very approachable technology. You use an iPhone, which is way more complicated than a hardware wallet, thankfully. Um, so check it out. Self-custody your own Bitcoin. It's good. So just conscious of time, uh, Harry, you always say everything is good for Bitcoin. And uh, I'm never sure whether that's just a meme or you actually mean it. Oh, I really think it. Um, I don't think everything's good for me, but I think everything's good for Bitcoin. And so, you know, to me, this is uh, the, other, the other version of that meme that isn't mine is um, uh, it's that, you know, you can't, you can't ban Bitcoin. You can only ban yourself from Bitcoin. And, and so I think, you know, we'll de we've already seen, you know, China mining ban, great example, right? They banned themselves from this hugely abundant uh, monetization of energy. And to me, that's like a total, a total self-inflicted wound on the people, but it was a way for the government to continue to maintain a higher degree of control. And so 
I think that that was a phenomenally good thing for Bitcoin and a pretty terrible thing for Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, and so I think we've got a lot of natural experiments that are out in the wild of examples where you know governments have punished their people as it relates to Bitcoin, but none of that hurt Bitcoin. It really strengthened Bitcoin's use case. You know, we're we're going to see this come out of Brussels um, in the EU in in the coming months, but. You know, they're very uncomfortable with self-hosted self -hosted wallets, aka running my own software. Um, and so I think we're going to see governments continue to demonstrate Bitcoin's use case, strengthen Bitcoin the network, and punish their people along the way. All right, we've run over time. Let's have a massive round of applause for the panelists.